In terms of idea generation, every video needs to either instill hope, uh, fear, or curiosity. It's got to do at least one of those three things. If you can do two, that's great. If you can do three, that's a miracle. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Plugin.fm podcast brought to you by Freemius. On this podcast, we get into the thick of things with accomplished product makers and brand builders to get their insights on making it in the web creator industry. Specifically, we take a look at their experiences to help you succeed with your own mission and vision. I'm Patrick Rolland, and today I have the pleasure of talking to WordPress plugin creator, educator, and YouTube star, Jamie Marsland. After filling roles ranging from managing director to chief technical officer, Jamie founded PoodlePress in 2010. PoodlePress offers various WordPress courses, one-day private website building tutorials with Jamie himself, a blog, valuable freebies, and both free and paid plugins. Today, we're looking specifically at Jamie's journey of growing a successful YouTube channel from zero to over 11,000 subscribers in less than three years. Jamie uploads high-quality tutorial-style videos every week that cover hot WordPress topics, ranging from AI to the block editor. And the best part? They're available for free. His strong online presence has secured him a seat at the WordPress expert table and helped establish PoodlePress as one of the main players in the Gutenberg era. Jamie, welcome to the show. Hi there, how are you? I am, you know, got a teensy bit of a cold, but I am in excellent spirits and I'm going to be great by tomorrow. That's good to hear. Perfect. So I obviously want to hear about YouTube in this, in this podcast, in this episode, but of course we also want to talk about your journey. And so, you know, I want to start with how, what got you into WordPress and what made you decide to do your own thing in the industry? So I was running a publishing company about whenever it was, 11 years ago, and we were using a different content management system called Ektron, which you probably won't have heard about. And, uh, <laughs> and I had a quite expensive um, development team who were very good. But this software was very thorough, but quite uh, clunky to develop with. It was commercial, so it was at the low end of the content management market back then, so, but we were still paying around $5,000 per site per license which might sound incredible to WordPress users, but that, that was cheap back in the day for a CMS. And we, were, we had a number of projects, and it was taking a long time. And then I discovered WordPress one weekend and got it out and realized I was able to basically develop what my guys were taking six months to develop in a weekend. So um, it kind of opened my eyes to, to WordPress and what was possible with it. And then when I left that business... I thought WordPress was a really interesting space to be in. And so I launched PoodlePress whenever it was 10, 11 years ago now. Mm. And just so I know, what version of WordPress was that roughly? Oh, I don't know. I've no, no idea. But we're talking, I've got no idea. That's a great question. But we're early days. But we had we had mm -hmm. themes and plugins back then. Um, uh -huh. And I was kind of experimenting with, back then, I guess I was using, I discovered BuddyPress, I guess. We were, using, we were mm -hmm. building some kind of community systems, I think, for that business. And also the P2 theme, which um, mm -hmm. used to be available as a download. Yeah. And we used that as an internal intranet. So that's, that's taking me back. And then when I, when, I, when I started off with WordPress, I became a big WooThemes uh, user. So I was really into WooThemes. Yeah. And one of their first themes was Gazette, the magazine theme. And then um, Canvas, and then obviously WooCommerce. So that's kind of been my, that was the, my early journey with, with WordPress. Love that. Love hearing that. Uh, so I do want to move on to YouTube. When did you realize that it was the right time to start a YouTube channel? So I have, I've had a YouTube channel for a number of years. And actually, some of the videos I put on there, uh, like four or five years ago, have got almost 100,000 views. But I just kind of put them up there and just ignore <laughs> ignore them completely. And they were completely focused around the products that we build. Um, so we have one product called WooBuilder Blocks, and so it was about how to customize the WooCommerce product page using WooBuilder Blocks. And those, those, um, those videos did really, really well. But then I guess about two years ago, maybe slightly longer, I decided to really have a go at YouTube properly because I could see... You know, it's, I have to be honest, I'm not quite sure why. I just wanted to start experimenting with the platform. Hmm. Um, so it wasn't a massively strategic decision. But I could see that um, some of the engagement that the other YouTubers were getting on YouTube with some of the videos were kind of incredible around certain hmm. subjects. And so I started to just kind of experiment with, with some ideas around specifically the block editor and putting out some 
content just about around the block editor, initially around some of our products. Uh, but then I started to do some videos around not our products, and those started to do really quite well. And I started to get some good engagement on those, which was an early lesson for me in terms of the sort of mm. content that people were interested in watching and engaging with. How how early did you get that feedback? You know, I, I always love to give people the advice of like, try this for three months, and then yeah. if you don't get any feedback, then quit. So like, what what what? Uh, how far in did you? <laughs> were, yeah, how well, far in? Pretty quick. I mean, because okay. <laughs> I did I did a number of videos around our our stuff, and they didn't get a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. And then I started to do some some broader videos around uh, the block editor, and yeah, for, you can tell very quickly that they they were getting traction. So it was a really in good indicator, which is blind, blindingly obvious to me now uh, that those were more interesting videos um, to watch and people got more value out of them than just trying to flog our own products, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> which I've really uh -huh. focused on for a while. <laughs> Flogging your own products doesn't work at all. <laughs> I, it, it's a great place to start uh, and learn your skills, but yes, obviously it doesn't have a huge appeal beyond your users. No, they yeah. particularly hate me for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm super. So did you have to learn anything specifically or set up anything specifically for YouTube? And one thing I want to touch on is you actually have a great for anyone who's watching this on YouTube right now. Um, you have a great backdrop. You know, it's well lit and it looks good. And um, yeah, how much does a good home studio setup cost? Also, I'd love to know that. So I would say the learning I've had over the last year and a half, specifically around YouTube, has been more than my learning with WordPress. Just to, just to give it some context, hmm. it's, it's a massive, like a five minute video it might look uh -huh. really, really simple. But for me, it's been an incredible amount of learning that you go through from studio to um, content bit, the storytelling bit, what people find interesting bit, how to end the video, how, how to start the video. So you might create a really fancy intro to your videos, but nobody cares about that. They want to get, they want the content and they want it quickly. There's a huge, huge, huge amount of learning that goes into becoming semi-good or good at uh, um, YouTube. And if I go back and look at my videos a year and a half ago, they're just, you know, I just, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're absolutely, I think they're absolutely dreadful. So, you know, you definitely go on a journey in terms of getting better at the stuff, in terms of how you pace them and stuff like that. And you, you get better yeah. in front of the camera. You get more, more natural yeah. in front of the camera, which is a big thing. So now yeah. I feel natural speaking to the camera whereas a year and a half ago and actually some of my product videos that i've got on my website are just <laughs> so dreadful uh -huh. <laughs> they sound like you know i'm literally reading from a script so anyway the second part of your compound question was studio setup yeah like well, is that a lot of effort and, and i think also yeah. another sorry here's an i'll add in more to the compound question is yeah. like do you think you need a stu like a a, a a well nicely designed backdrop studio yeah i didn't think so until i walked around WordCamp. EU a few weeks ago in Athens and because people walk, people came up to me at that event and um, it was, it was a fascinating event just because I've been to the work camps before and I've had anon anonymity. So literally nobody, nobody bothers to speak to you, even though I've been running a plugin business and a training business for 10 years. Whereas this time I, I walked around the, the hall and people would literally come up and ask for selfies, which was kind of really, really bizarre. Um, but they assume that when they, when they see my backdrop, and if you see my YouTube channel, this is the backdrop. And they assume they all have a visual idea of where I'm actually sitting. You know, they all have uh -huh. that. They all have that impression because it's such a visual medium of where I am. You uh -huh. know? And some people thought I was in a barn on an island. You know, uh -huh. this beautiful place in England, and they uh -huh. they create this. They create this kind of visual tapestry of where you might be going. So even though it's not. I wouldn't say it's essential to have a nice backdrop. I think definitely, I think definitely it does add to the, it does add to the sort of what you're communicating because it's a visual, uh, it's a visual language that you're communicate, communicating. So it's all, hmm. you know, so for my, my backdrop is designed, you know, I've designed it to yeah. look like that. It's not by accident, that color on the wall, that's the fifth coat of a certain shade of color that I went <laughs> and found because I thought it, it matched the kind of, um, aesthetic that I was after. So it's all, it's all very deliberate for me. I wouldn't say that's yeah. vital in terms of the no. you know, spending on the content, but it definitely, definitely yeah. helps. Is it, uh, is it sort of like, you know, dressing up to an interview? Is it that type of like, you just want to present yourself in the best possible way? I think it's not. Yeah. 
yeah, a bit, but it's not necessarily the best possible way, but it's sort of the way that suits your, mm-hmm. the editorial voice of your videos. I sure. Think. Yeah. Your style. So, yeah. Your style. So, you know, some people will have neon lights behind them and be very shouty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's not my natural. I mean, that's the other thing. I couldn't do that because that's not my natural shouty, aggressive style. Yeah. So it kind of well, has to fit in with the overall right. tone of the channel, I think, for me. So this 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 uh, dovetails nicely into the next question, which is: so a couple episodes back, we we talked with Matt Medeiros about podcasting, which has its yeah. own challenges. Yeah. Um, with YouTubing, I would love to know. So I think a couple things I'd love to know about is like. Editing seems like a separate skill, like yeah. channeling your creativity and knowing what is uh, going to resonate with your audience seems like a separate skill. And of course, yeah. all the technical nitty gritty stuff. Um, how long did it take you to learn all those? Like, is this a three year process? Uh, yeah, but the good news is you, you, you don't have to be very good at it to start with. And I'm, you know, mm. I think you can keep things you can get very focused with the, with the YouTube stuff on the wrong stuff as well, rather than the content. So you can mm. spend three days doing a backdrop and you can get the best camera, the best audio equipment and still produce absolute garbage in terms of content. So mm. for me, a lot of my effort has been, and I'm still trying to get much, much better at this is trying to get better at the storytelling aspect of each video. And, and, and that has a specific angle when you're talking about sort of educational videos. Um, For example, some of my videos when I'm doing, I did one last week, which was um, comparing block themes to classic themes. So I could have taken that as an idea, which is quite an interesting idea, and say, compare block theme to a classic theme, and I could do the review. But instead, I got my daughter, who's a WordPress beginner, to actually, I gave her 10 tasks to do with Spectra 1 and Cadence. And that, that suddenly becomes a completely different an interesting piece of content as opposed to just a straight boring this is just me talking about the, the benefits of each theme so that bit the co- the content bit i'm constantly trying to um get better at rather than the editing stuff comes naturally as, as you mm. you just get better at that stuff and you learn about that stuff and that stuff is really important but really the focusing on the content for me has been much more like much much more important than the the technical aspects for example i film i bought some expensive cameras but now i just film on an iphone oh huh. yeah so my cam i built and then i use ScreenFlow to do the editing and recording uh, i've got some uh yeah filters that make it look a bit nicer so i can adjust the sort of color grade on it a little bit um, and the editing, I'm fairly ferocious with the head with the editing. I see a lot of people that don't edit their videos now. So I'm, you know, kill your darlings and all that really, I try and, uh-huh. I try and be really quite, I'd spend a lot of time editing hmm. in terms of just cutting stuff out. So we get, so it gets through it quite quickly. Um, uh, but yeah, I've got a very, I've got a really simple studio setup and that's kind of deliberate because I really just want to focus as much as possible on the ideas and the content. Yeah. So many years back, I did a 30 day blogging challenge and day one was very hard because, you know, you you don't know what topic to pick and what, and what, what, how to write and how to structure stuff. And day two is a little bit easier and day three is a little bit easier and day four is a little bit easier. And probably by after a week, I like got it. And then by the end of the month, I was like, knock out a blog post in two hours, um, slightly shorter blog posts than I typically write now, but still is video creation like that. Is it like, you know, is it like just really hard just to like, I think I agree with you. I think storytelling is probably the hardest aspect. It's, it's how do I frame this, this piece of information that I want to give to my audience? Is that something that you just get better at? You know, is it, if you do a month of YouTube videos, are you just going to be infinitely better than if you don't, don't start with a month of practice? Yeah. And I think there's, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a few bits to that. The one is when I started, I had like two ideas for videos and I was really worrying I'm not going to have any ideas for videos. Now I've got a spreadsheet of literally mm-hmm. 200 videos and ideas, which I, I love most of them. And I kind of change, juggle them around. So that's the first thing you, you get this, you get this creative flex muscle that just grows as the, the more you do. So if anyone's sitting there thinking, I don't have any ideas for videos, you know, one of the big lessons on this is just start because you'll get, mm-hmm. it's amazing how that creative muscle just uh, kicks into action pretty quickly. It's it's mm. it's staggering how that works. In terms of the actual process, I'm still quite, <laughs> I'm still quite. So uh, so I have a fairly my. So I just explain my process because I have a sure. the the way I work 
And this, this is just the way I work. So in terms of, I, there's a few phases to it. So idea generation generally happens whenever. So I've got a rolling spreadsheet sheet of ideas and those I try and I'm trying every idea I try and if it gets to the top, it, it should either, and I've got this sort of criteria, which I stole from somebody else, which is every re- video needs to either instill hope, uh, fear or curios- curiosity. It's got to do at least one of those three things. If you, if you can do two, that's great. If you can do three, that's a miracle. But it has to have at least one of those three things to even get it on get get it on the spreadsheet. If, if it's not going to do any of those things, then people probably aren't going to find it very interesting to watch. So and so, I have an ideas generation, a rolling spreadsheet. It's very simple. And then um, and then I'll plan the videos in terms of trying to put a story behind it. And that's just paper, you know, write out kind of. And I'm starting to try and get into more like a story arc when I'm creating these videos mm-hmm. as well. It's hard, that stuff, to, to frame that in a sort of WordPress tutorial. Um, and then I always shoot my videos in the morning, never in the afternoon because I'm a morning person. That's when I'm my, my brain's best. Uh, and then I'll plan them and sort of prep them in the afternoon. And that's kind of my rolling action plan, really. Um, that's, the, that's what works for me, but different people will have different ways of working. Yeah, love that. But, but I haven't got a lot better at the – I have got better at the editing and all that stuff and the technology, but it still takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think if you're trying to communicate something important, it always takes a long time to think about the the perfect way to frame it. Yeah. And there's no never been what. a video that I haven't finished and published and realized afterwards it could have been a lot better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, like I get that. really obvious. I definitely get I think any creative work, you will always see – Areas to improve, and I'm, I'm sure YouTube is no different. Yeah. So, okay, so you were talking about your schedule, and one of my questions that I have written down here is: so you're still juggling Poodle Press, yeah, uh, which is plugins and courses, yeah. So I imagine there's a balancing act. Yeah. How much time do you dedicate to YouTube, and how much time do you dedicate to Poodle Press? So I'm probably what am I I'm doing? About two videos a week at the moment, and each one takes about half a day. So that gives you some idea, and the rest of the time. Um, to Poodle Press, but they're kind of starting to feed into each other naturally now, a bit more as well. But yeah, it's a chunk. Of, it is a chunk of time to to commit to it. I'd like to up it to three videos a week at some point soon yeah. as well. I, I mean, two. So two videos, each one being a half a day. So that's not a crazy amount of time on YouTube. I, yeah. How about this? Have you ever? Have you ever had to? juggle back and forth with poodle press and youtube have you ever had to make sacrifices for poodle press you know um no no no, great no not really because um no not really i mean it's um no not really not really at all actually so it kind of it kind of works quite well and obviously video you can shoot any time of the day really uh, and weekends as well so you you've got complete flexibility when you're gonna when you're gonna shoot this stuff Got it. Got it. Okay. So there's a ton of you. Do yeah. you have to market and like get, how do you get people to notice you on YouTube when you start? That's a good question. So when I started, I actually, um, that's a really good question. So, so I have a, I have a, a natural email list, which I built from my training and plugin business. So that's definitely one way. Um, Another way has been I've done a bunch of videos where I've either interviewed other people or got other people to be involved in the videos. Those have worked really well. So I did a video when I hit 3,000 subscribers called What WordPress Stacked That the WordPress Pros Use. And I got, I mean, this is the other great thing about YouTube. It gives you, it gives you permission to go and speak to people that you would normally struggle to go and speak to, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I asked about 20 or 30 other people to get involved in that video good names in the WordPress um, space. And obviously, once you've done a, a piece of content like that, they'll share it out for you. So whether that's yeah. they're sharing it on their blog or on Twitter. So that was that was a really good way of sort of getting my my name out there. Just just ask ask people and people are really willing to to get involved in that sort of stuff. And then just trying to focus on the content has probably been the most important thing for me. And having a certain uh, authenticity about the content, you know? Yeah. Okay. So then I feel like this is the the question I've been building to this whole time. How has YouTube impacted your business? That's a great question. So I think the first thing to say is I never really started this as a, as a particularly direct link to, to do that, but it's had, so in terms of there's two bits of that, one is the direct consequences of the business. So for example, 
um, I launched a block theme course, an, in, um, an online block theme course about three months ago. Uh, and I would say probably 80% of the people that signed up for that course came from YouTube, came from my YouTube channel. 80%? Yeah, and, and most of them from the States, um, whereas before my wow. training in WordPress has been UK-based, um, which which isn't that surprising, but it is surprising in a way. But it wasn't it wasn't kind of a deliberate, I'm going to launch this YouTube channel because at some point I'm going to start a, block, um, a course around block themes. It was just a natural evolution of what I was doing. Um, yeah, and, and also the one-day website builds that I do occasionally with clients. Those are primarily coming from YouTube now. Whereas before that, wow. might, that might have been um, organic SEO or it might have been some paid ads. Now that's primarily coming from people who found me on YouTube. And which is, which is amazing because you get, like I was, I did this site for a um, guy called Eric Noden the other day who's a blues, blues guitarist out of Nashville. I mean, that's kind of mind blowing, right? He yeah. just followed my YouTube channel and, got in touch and we had this great day building his uh, new website. Uh-huh. And so, you, you know, it's, it's truly the reach on it is the reach on it is amazing, but the engagement on it is an, is a completely different level to any other kind of marketing I've ever done for, because people think they get to know you properly through video, like no, no other yeah. medium I've ever yeah. engaged with before, whether that's organic SEO or anything, it's a completely different level of engagement. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, video is clearly the richest medium for for communication, and I I think podcasting is good because you know you're you're in people's ears and that yeah. feels intimate, but it, but it, there's no visuals, so it's it's different. So okay, so have you ever tried to calculate the ROI of no. your YouTube? No, no, is, is it just too hard to calculate? I think it's uh, it's too hard to calculate. It probably is too hard to calculate. You definitely could do it, but I'm also. It's a moving feast for me because I'm growing quite quickly at the moment. So where I'm at, where I'm at today is going to be very different to um, a year's time in terms of subscribers and views and, and, and base content and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the unintended consequences of YouTube have been amazing as well. You know, so the things that you don't plan that will get it. So not just the sort of direct ROI that you might get from it, just the sort of from a brand point of view, from the fact that you can. You know, I, I interviewed Matt Mullenweg a few weeks ago and Chris yeah. Lemmer and, and you get this, you get this amazing engagement and reach with these, these people that you just, you just would never get unless you were to, putting out this sort of content. Yeah. I mean, it's been a bit mind blowing actually. And especially when I was at WordPrint, um, WordCamp Path and uh, EU a few weeks ago, it was, it was a very surreal few days just walking around when people would come up to me and say hi you know, and almost like little fans of your YouTube channel. It's astonishing. Absolutely. So have you tried uh, or thought about YouTube shorts at all? I mean, just because you're on YouTube, have you thought yeah. about that shorter TikTok-like format? Yeah. And I've started, I did it. I've, I've, I'm, my plan is to go big on shorts over the next six months. Okay. My plan is to go to, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of going all in on YouTube over the next six, six months, really. So my plan is to do three videos a week, long form, and then a short, maybe three or four shorts a week. Uh, I did, I did a few recently actually, which have gone all right. Um, okay. so, I, and that was repurposing content. So I repurposed some of the interview content with, um, Matt Mullenweg, the interview there. Oh, cool. Yeah. And it's really good stuff. And also the, the, the Chris Lemmer interview about AI as well. And the Yoast interview that I did at Word, um, WordCamp EU as well. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go big on shorts. I think they're, I think they're definitely interesting. I know people have mixed results on them. Mm-hmm. But I think they're a good. I, I like the format for certain things. That, yeah. So, I, but I, I think it's. I'm just starting to get an idea of the sort of content that works well on it. Yeah, I, I imagine it's just a. Di- it's a different medium. I know it's on the same platform technically, but yeah. it just feels like a different medium. It's a different medium, yeah, and you've got to approach it as a different way. But I think it's a. I think I was watching this video the other day. Um, I can't remember his name, but he was saying he uses this is quite, and this has actually been my process for for sort of testing some ideas anyway. So. I use Twitter to sort of sort of test some of my content ideas. So I'll put a tweet oh, cool. out and the tweets that get a lot of engagement, I'll turn into YouTube videos. And he was doing exactly the same thing for YouTube shorts. So if it's a tweet and it goes well, literally that could be the YouTube short. So I think there's this content that you're creating anyway that you can sort of repurpose that's interesting content on YouTube shorts as well. So yeah, I'm going big on YouTube shorts. I think it's interesting. 
Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing for me is if people are already searching on YouTube, you might as well also have a short yeah. that covers like a same top because it can, it can be found in YouTube search. So that's the, that's the one thing that makes it feel really special from TikTok is people aren't searching on TikTok. That's right. They're searching on YouTube. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I've I only sort of dabble in YouTube shorts, but it's very strange. Like you'll put, you'll put out a short and it'll literally, you'll have like eight views after an hour. I put one out last week and then it, and then I would look back an hour later and it was like a thousand views within the hour. And I was thinking, holy, what, what's going on here? And then it suddenly dies. So you get this, it's incredibly volatile wow. action on YouTube. Show. And I guess it's just whether the algorithm is surfacing the short on the, on the phone. So well, let I think me, the, sorry, the other thing is, I think I'll get yeah. better at them. So I need to do them. I yeah. need to, yeah. It's worth, it's worth experimenting for sure. Yeah. I, I, I definitely agree. Okay, so I, I we talked about this already a little bit in passing uh, about ideas, but I just I don't think you can talk to someone about YouTube or podcasting or or writing without asking them like how do you start building that ideas spreadsheet? How do you get started with that process? Process because it is really hard. And besides saying just get started, which is good advice, yeah. But is there anything else besides just get started to help people generate their first thirty ideas? I would, I would go and yeah, that's a good question. I'm just trying to think back how I did it. Um, I mean, this is going to sound very strange, but I get all my, most of my ideas when I'm showering. So maybe shower a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's really strange. I literally get almost every single YouTube idea. And I think, I think you've got to sort of, I have a, I have a fairly, a brain that bounces around a lot. So I think um, if your brain doesn't do that, then maybe, you know, find somebody that you can bounce and brainstorm ideas off. But for me to do a video, I have to get excited about it. It has to have a, a little adrenaline kick. Um, and then look at what, I mean, maybe look at what other YouTubers are doing. But I think what's exciting about YouTube, it's, it's your space to do really whatever you like. And, mm -hmm. and it's a real opportunity to, um, do, you, do you remember the painter, Bob Ross, who used to do those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so one, <laughs> one of his things was he always used to say, this is your world. You can do, you know, you can paint what you like. And I think that's that's a really nice sort of analogy for YouTubers. It's really your creative space to, to you know, everyone's got unique experiences. And if you can bring those out and be authentic, this isn't helping your people come up with ideas. But I think that's, that's the kind of premise of what excites me about YouTube, that you can really, you know, it's your personal stuff that you find that you, that you that you can bring to it that other people will find interesting. And don't think what you think is interesting, other people won't find interesting because it's you will find an audience if you're authentic to yourself. No question yeah. about it. But it's if you're not if you're not doing that, one you won't be able to sustain it because you'll just get sick of it. Mm. And I think people, it, video really shows up in authenticity like no other medium. So you just can't. It just won't work anyway. So you might as well just start with being yourself and think about what interests you. Uh, and you will find, my experience is you will find an audience that, that finds that stuff interesting. Fantastic. L love that. It's very hopeful. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's very hopeful. But I would also go back to those three things, which is, you know, does it instill curiosity, fear, or hope? Right. Does your idea do any of those three things? It's got to do at least one of those three things. So start with those sort of criteria when you're thinking about your, your idea. Fantastic. Yeah. Now you, okay. So you have, you're doing two videos a week up uh, soon, upping it to three, hopefully for YouTube, yeah. but you also have some like video courses and other stuff on Poodle press. Yeah. How do you decide what is worth keeping as a paid course? And how do you decide what is worth making free available for free on YouTube? Um, another great question. So some, I guess my YouTube videos generally are not like an hour or three hour long you know, from start to finish video tutorials, they'll take an idea and they'll explore it in detail, but they won't, they won't really be the start to finish thing. So they won't, they won't be like, if you want to build an e-commerce website from start to finish, and it's not a five hour tutorial, <laughs> um, there'll be, you know, how you can upsell, how you can upsell people by a hundred percent using WooCommerce. And they'll, they'll take certain aspects of it and, and focus on those aspects rather than the start to finish. Whereas the courses are kind of, more start to finish type courses, the more sort of, you know, if you want to start here and then finish here, then, then that's what you should do. That's kind of the, the, the basic difference, I guess, as well. Have you tried any full length course like content on YouTube? Yeah. in the olden days I did. So, um, and it went pretty well. I mean, it dates fairly quickly. That's the only thing about that stuff. So, um, and I think there is a thing around, 
um, adding value over and above just the video tutorials as well. So for example, if you're, if you join, so where my, my online courses, if you join that, then you also get access to me at certain points over that period as well. So it's not just around, here's some information. You also get some hand holding and expert and advice and other stuff as well. Some tools to help you build your site. Yeah. yeah. For courses, you want to have extras that makes a, lot, a community, a discord or, or something. Yeah, exactly. Lessons yeah. you can turn in that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. So I got one last question for you. Um, and I think this is basically, what did you learn along the way uh, on your journey into YouTube? And is there anything you would do over if you could? I guess if I was giving you advice, then just show up, just showing up mm. twice a week, getting a routine. Routine for me is really important. So routine and being consistent and showing up and being incredibly disciplined about that process. Then naturally, if you just do that, you will get better at it and you will build an audience of some kind. So you've got to give it, I would say, at least a year, 100 videos and a year um, before you before you get to the point where you don't hate looking at your videos and you're comfortable <laughs> looking back at your videos. So you've, consistency and turning up is probably the, the biggest lesson for me. Everything else will flow from that, but routine of, and turning up. What was, the, what was the second part of that? Is there anything you would do over if you could? I would no, because it's gone pretty well. It's gone pretty, ask me in a year. It's gone pretty well. It's gone much better than I thought it was going to go. Actually, um, mm. I'd probably say focus less on the technology. I've definitely gone down some technology cul-de-sacs and focus more on the art of storytelling rather than the all the technical nonsense that you get sucked into storytelling, 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 storytelling. Can, I would say, yeah. So we've talked a lot about storytelling and I, I agree storytelling is a critical part of marketing in general. Yeah. Um, so for, I mean, but it's also a nebulous concept. Like how, do, how do you, how does someone learn storytelling? Is there a book or a video you'd recommend? Uh, there's loads of books. I can't remember any, I've read so many books on storytelling, but okay. I would look into um, like a three, I would look at things like just sort of Google three story act is a good way to start. And you'll okay. look at that sort of stuff. Storytelling of movies is really fascinating to look at. Um, I, I read, a, I watched a great video on the guys from South Park the other day that were talking about they have story beats in in um, South Park, and they say what you need to be able to do at any point in that story is to almost say if we stop the story here, then you you need to say what happens what happens next, and this is you know this is quite hard in the WordPress space because you're con constantly sucked into. Oh, it's got a button here. And if you click that button, then this happens and then this happens and this happens and then this happens. It gets really prosaic and you can produce these very boring, quick videos very quickly. And I'm still not where I want to be in terms of the storytelling bit. Um, but that's, that's where people get engaged in, in video. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would say, look at the three story act. There are obviously lots of places you can go read about storytelling. I don't have one specific book. And YouTube is a great place to learn about storytelling as well, is the other thing to say. There's some great YouTube creators out there. So there's a guy called Ed from Film Booth. He's definitely worth checking out. And there's a channel called Creators YouTube Channel. Those are those are two great places on YouTube to sort of dive more into storytelling um, and YouTube in particular. Uh, but yeah, I would focus try and focus on that stuff more than the technical stuff. Fantastic. And we're technical people by nature, so we tend to get drawn into that stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you for this advice. I'm going to tell my boss that I need to watch YouTube videos for work. So I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go do that. But um, cool, uh, thank this you. has been this has been really good, Jamie. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us on another episode of Plugin.fm, where we sit down with exceptional product entrepreneurs and business owners who share the unique stories as well as actionable tips and strategies based on firsthand experience. If you enjoyed this episode, hit like and subscribe to let the algorithms know they should push more eyes and ears to our YouTube page. If you're on the Plugin.fm website, simply smash the subscribe to be the first to know what's coming up. Or amplify the episode on social media so we can help entrepreneurs like you in their journeys too. Plugin.fm is brought to you by Freemius, your all-in-one e-commerce partner for selling software, plugins, themes, and software as a service. If you're struggling to grow your plugin revenue, send a note to contact at freemius.com to get free advice from Freemius's monetization experts. My name is Patrick Rolland, and thanks for joining us on Plugin.fm.